How's that? That's better. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this um, educational talk on, on Sabre. And I'll continue in the vein that we've already seen, trying to establish some of the basic principles of how we can utilize para hydrogen. What uh, you'll notice is there'll be a little bit of a repetition in the earlier slides, but I think that'll be quite beneficial and perhaps help us achieve uh, an understanding of some of the finer points. So before I move on to the talk, I'd just like to make sure I acknowledge many of the people that have, have taken part in the work that I'm going to present today. Um, and you can see those feature, uh, Jos Lohmann, for example, from Brooker, Gary Green, Megan Hulse, uh, Eugen Hennig, Jan Hovner, Adrian Kennelly, Robin Perutz, and Sven Klein. Um, moving forward, what I'd like to do is just to, to tell you a little bit of a story about Sabre and make it clear that it was developed in collaboration with Gary Green at York. Um, and what we put forward was a bid in, in 2007 to try and achieve the sensitization of materials without their hydrogenation using parahydrogen. And we've already seen just how uh, elegant parahydrogen can work. So going forward, you can see here, this describes parahydrogen. We've already heard some of this this morning. What we're talking about is looking at the singlet state of hydrogen, which we've seen is relatively easy to create. Um, what we're going to have to do is to break the symmetry of that state. And we can do that by introducing a reaction. So if we take parahydrogen in the singlet state, we add this molecule to a metal complex, what you can see um, is that we can form a dihydride, and that dihydride is going to evolve under time. So the singlet is going to evolve if there's a difference in chemical shift. In other words, if these two protons here If these two protons here become inequivalent, we're going to see evolution under the chemical shift term. But if they couple differently to another spin now in L, we can also get evolution of that singlet state, which is previously invisible to NMR. So it's going to be the evolution of the zero quantum X term and the longitudinal two spin order term that's going to create visible magnetization from this latent parahydrogen. And we're going to see later on uh, an elegant talk, I'm sure, describing some of the features of parahydrogen more rigorously. But what I'm focusing on here is we can achieve this difference in two, two hydrides in our metal product by designing the complex appropriately. But we've seen already that we can create hydrogenation products one thing that hasn't been talked about earlier was just this concept of one proton fit that was put forward by Rich Eisenberg. And that is when a single proton that's derived from parahydrogen can become enhanced. And we've already learned a little bit about Sabre, which I'm going to continue to explain. So if we think about harvesting this latent magnetism of parahydrogen, the early work by Dan Weiterkamp set out to take a metal catalyst, parahydrogen, and introduce it into an organic substrate, a hydrogenation product. And this hydrogenation product was going to be created from parahydrogen. So we were only going to populate energy levels, which here are alpha, beta, and beta alpha in the product. And the result is that we were going to see strong signals because the population difference across those energy levels is much larger than we would otherwise predict. And I've been very fortunate 
in terms of working with para-hydrogen for a number of years. So the first measurements that I took uh, using para-hydrogen actually were made in 1990. What you can see here is an example of para-hydrogen adding to a metal complex. And what we're looking at are these enhanced resonances in the metal complex. And in this case, the chemical shift difference of these metal hydride resonances is diagnostic of the ligand that's binding at this six site in our iridium complex. So we can use this signal enhancement productively to see new materials. In fact, sorry, I'm just gonna have to try and work out, so it seems to be only displaying um, even slides rather than odd slides. So you might just have to give me a moment to try and work out. What's happening in this presentation? Okay, we'll continue from here. So just using this um, approach, we can add para hydrogen to a metal complex and we can control that if we introduce photochemistry. So in this case, what we're going to see is we've got a metal dihydride complex and we can irradiate it with light and that's going to create this 16 electron intermediate. And that 16 electron intermediate is going to be able to add hydrogen reversibly. And what's going to happen is we're going to go back to the starting point, our metal dihydride complex. But if we've used para hydrogen, these signals are going to be stronger than they otherwise would be. If we now interrogate the metal hydride resonances and we've used pure para hydrogen, we can obviously quantify a signal gain. And we can do that and measure the resulting intensity. We can compare it to that created under Boltzmann conditions. And this shows you that you can actually create a pure singlet state. In other words, by using hydrogen that was cooled 20 Kelvin or so, we can create a pure NMR state in our product. In this case, the signals are around 32,000 times their normal intensity when recorded at 9.4 Tesla. So if we think about harnessing that, what we might appreciate as an inorganic chemist is that there are many metal dihydrides, and some of them are unstable. So here we've got an example of adding to iridium complex. We've got cyclooctadiene as a ligand, but we can destroy that because we can hydrogenate it, so it will no longer bind. And if we do this reaction in the presence of pyridine, we can create a new iridium complex where we've now got resonances that are going to arise from protons that were in parahydrogen and three pyridine ligands attached to this complex. If we run an XE measurement and we probe the magnetism on one of these ligands here, and we encode the reaction time, what we can see is that the resonance that was bound begins to move into the site for the free pyridine. And as a consequence, we see a drop in signal intensity and a growth in signal intensity. In other words, this complex is unstable on the NMR timescale here over around a second. So if we recognize this instability and we note that our hydride resonances are coming from para hydrogen and therefore their spin order is amplified with respect to the Boltzmann distribution, it's quite simple to interrogate them using an inept type sequence where we can encode a hydride and we can go through the inept protocol and we can transfer polarization in this case to a coupled spin and that coupled spin is going to be the nitrogen center here of our pyridine ligand. We can move the magnetization back into the z-axis, we can wait a delay and then we can make a measurement by applying a 90 degree pulse 
to uh, now magnetization that's sitting on nitrogen. In other words, we can create a strongly enhanced nitrogen signal in our pyridine ligand, and that dissociates and gives us a resonance in the free material. So we've achieved polarization transfer without needing to functionalize a material using parahydrogen. If we go through quite a rigorous mathematical analysis of what's happening in low magnetic field under the influence of coupling and chemical shift, what we can spot is that these hydride signal intensity, the spin order that's sitting on the hydrides, can spontaneously transfer through into the product. In this case, the bound pyridine ligand. And that can happen without the need for RF excitation, like I've just illustrated using the inept experiment. What we see here is that the efficiency of this process is going to change with the magnetic field that the sample experienced, and that we're going to be able to create a number of terms, in this case, um, longitudinal spin order, and we're also going to be able to create zero quantum X and other magnetization on the two spins in this case, that are going to couple to our parahydrogen derived hydride ligands. And that magnetization is going to survive dissociation because there is no uh, terms here that refer to the original labels in parahydrogen. So we've achieved spontaneous transfer. You can see if we do that at low field, very close to zero, we're going to retain the singlet spin order for parahydrogen in the product. So that's the concept. Pragmatically, it's very easy to achieve. What we're looking at is simply taking an NMR tube, which we've already seen, and that NMR tube is going to um, be shaken to dissolve the parahydrogen gas in the presence of our metal complex to form the dihydride and ligand exchange. And we're going to get an enhanced signal in our product. So this enhanced signal is actually very important because it can be very strong. Here you can see some of our early results just showing our nicotinamide here. Normally we would see nothing, so the concentration is quite low in solution. And yet this simple shape with parahydrogen results in a strong set of resonances for the proton resonances there of our now free nicotinamide, working well here for pyridine. So the concept of SABER is defined. We're going to take the substrate, we're going to bring it into contact with parahydrogen within a metal complex. That substrate is going to dissociate and the resonances of the substrate are going to be enhanced. And during this process, we're going to have to have some form of exchange to refresh the parahydrogen in the metal complex. So we've got catalysis, but it's catalysis dealing with a change in magnetism rather than a change in substrate identity. And the process, as we've set out and others now for a number of years, is quite efficient. You can see here are just some typical results showing very substantial signal gains. Pyridine, the 15N signal of pyridine, carbon-13, phosphorus, and other groups. So the SABER concept is multinuclear capable, and we're going to learn more about that in one of the later talks today by everyone. But what I wanted to focus on for a moment was just this process is cat catalytic. So that means it's gonna be dependent on the identity of the catalyst. And what you can see here is when we set out the SABER, we use some phosphine containing catalysts, you can vary that phosphine ligand. There's a whole vast array of phosphines that have been used for catalytic processes more generally, and we've selected some of them here. And you can see the outcome in terms of now the efficiency of SABER is strongly dependent on the catalyst 
identity. We've spent quite a lot of time trying to explore that over the years, but I'd just like to refer you now to this article here by Barsky, which very elegantly shows how Sabre is going to be dependent on the rates of substrate dissociation. So that's the lifetime under which there's a coupling between the hydrides and the ligand nuclei. It's going to be dependent on the relaxation times as well in the catalyst because we've got propagation of magnetization within the catalyst and the lifetimes of magnetization on the substrate. So relaxation is going to be a very important property in terms of savor. We've spent quite a lot of time working through a variety of savor catalysts. This shows you some of the um, most optimum results going through this process of catalyst and substrate design. What we're wanting to do is to make the ligand exchange rate match the propagation of magnetization transfer. And we're wanting to extend the relaxation times on the catalyst and on the substrate such that we can build up and retain polarization for a long period of time. So here you can see the results of this for nicotinate. So there's four hydrogen atoms here. We go through Sabre, as you've seen, that simple shake, and we can end up with around 3% polarization. If we change the relaxation characteristics by adding deuterium and we deuterate the catalyst, in other words, during that propagation of magnetization from parahydrin into the bound substrate, we lose a smaller amount due to relaxation. Then you can see we can get 60 plus percent polarization in around 10 seconds using that shape. And here are just some other examples. So there's a number of people that have undertaken this work. And I'd just like to point out Peter Rayner here who's made many of these systems and led on many of these measurements here. How good is Sabre for heteronuclei? We're still working on optimizing this, but in this particular instance here where we've got a carbon-13 pair and we've got long relaxation times, we can achieve 25% carbon-13 polarization. And using the optimum catalysts, in fact, and some of the Sabre sheath approaches that we're going to learn about next, you can actually get 80% nitrogen 15 polarization. So I think the results are very substantial. The question is how can we use them? Or well, one way we can use Sabre is to create singlet states, because as I've told you, if we do the transfer under the right conditions, either very low magnetic field or simply retaining uh, um, a second order spin system within the catalyst, what we can do is we can spontaneously polarize a singlet. In other words, we've got readout for a long period of time subsequently. And here you can see some of the lifetimes in these molecules that we've been searching for singlet states and others have been uh, working in the same area and uh, leading in, in fact as we'll learn from Malcolm Levitt later on. But what you can see here is some of the applications now. So we can use the signal gain that we generate from um, Sabre to allow us to make very low concentration materials visible in a single scan. We can actually use it to detect metal complexes. And we've spent quite a lot of time working on using Sabre to study catalytic reactions in the past. And you can use the approaches to collect rapidly two-dimensional spectra. And you can monitor, in this case, an unexpected hydrogenation reaction. So there's a lot of opportunities to use Sabre analytically. You can see we can expand the scope of Sabre. So at the moment, we've been talking about systems where the ligand attaches to iridium and polarization flows from parahydrin into the ligand. 
and the ligand associates. But if the ligand itself is reactive, in this case, you can see a ligand, an amine that undergoes proton transfer. Then what we're going to be able to do is to move an enhanced proton into a receptor like an alcohol, for example, glucose. And the result is that we're now going to have polarization transfer from an enhanced proton into the coupled spins of the alcohol. So that is the result that you can see here, carbon-13 enhancement of glucose. But you can do this in terms of a metal complex where we have a dihydride, a pyridine ligand, pyridine ligand falls off, and that pyridine ligand then binds to a second metal complex, and that sensitizes the protons and the phosphorus resonances in our second metal complex. So what we're talking about here is the idea that we can take Sabre and move it forward into materials that haven't come into contact with parahydrine at all. So we're relaying that transfer of magnetization via an intermediary into new materials. One of the challenges that I've already talked about in terms of magnetization is relaxation, the destruction of that hard one polarization. If we want to overcome relaxation, we can pick specific nuclei, and I'm illustrating some results here for 29 silicon. What you can see is we can take this proton and we can exchange it for an enhanced proton using the Sabre relay approach. And if we do so, we can enhance the 29 silicon resonance because it's coupled to that proton. So we can see a signal in the silicon spectrum directly that we wouldn't otherwise be able to detect. And in this case, this reflects 4% polarization. But if we introduce a reactive system, so in here, we're going to introduce triplate. And what we're now going to look at is a substitution. So we're going to replace the proton the triplet. The two silicon centers give different chemical shifts and therefore we can watch this reaction in real time. Because we've got very strong signal intensity, we can see the reaction evolving out to 60 seconds now because these silicon centers have long T1s. But because we have very strong signal, we can correct for that T1. So we can actually, using an appropriate NMR pulse sequence, we can come up with a normalized response. In other words, this response is quantitative because we've corrected the T1 and the pulse angle. And we can just simply integrate that data now and use that to measure the rate constant. So this is one of the benefits really of using hyperpolarization. We can think about producing NMR signals that now are directly proportional to concentration, even though we're using a hyperpolarized system. And that gives us an opportunity to collect quantitative data directly. In terms of metal complexes more generally, with care, we can design our metal catalyst such that it will bind weakly interacting ligands. So here is an example of a weakly interacting ligand of iridium, it's pyruvate. And what we can now do is transfer the magnetization from our hydrogen into the two carbon-13 spins here, of pyruvate, and that pyruvate associates. What you can see is that we can create a singlet in our pyruvate. The lifetime of that singlet is around 77 seconds. And we can begin to think about using that signal from pyruvate. In this case, you can see we've got a simple image, carbon-13 image. But if we wanted to look at a very simple reaction, this is something Ben's done very recently, what you can see is that we can take our pyruvate, we can add hydrogen peroxide, we can 
drive the conversion of pyruvate into ethanoic acid. And we can measure the appropriate carbon-13 spectra to encode that change, and we can fit the appropriate data to extract rates of reaction. So what I hope I've done there is shown you a number of approaches where we can take the SABRE approach and use it analytically. We're working very hard to collect in vivo images using this approach, and we think we're just about there. And Aaron Kennelly joined York very recently, um, and we're trying to take forward some of the carbon-13 measurements now in vivo. We've come up with routes to create biocompatible systems where we're able to inject into animals and see no adverse effects. And, but for uh, the lockdown, I think we would have had our first carbon-13 images in vivo. So I'd like to move to the last slide and just tell you that I've told you quite a lot about parahydrin. I've told you about how we can use it in different, different ways. And this picture I think is a quite appropriate because we've learned a lot about parahydrin. Perhaps some of you don't realize that parahydrin was the fuel of the space shuttle. And that's why I'm saying that parahydrin is the route to the stars. Thank you very much for your attention. That's fantastic, Simon. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple questions that came in already. Uh, the first is, could deuteration of the catalyst provide a better polarization transfer? Yes, in, it does. So in many cases, it's not always uh, generic, but in many cases, deuteration of the catalyst does provide a much improved uh, level of polarization transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, second question is, could the bulkiness, or that is the size of the catalyst, affect the dynamic properties in the polarization transfer? Or is it more important to tune the dynamics of the transient binding of the parahydrogen and substrate to the catalyst itself? So it's kind of a, you know, is, it, is, it, is tuning the size of the catalyst the right thing to do? Or is it more important to tune the dynamics of the, of the, um, of the binding? I think the dynamics of the process are very important. Um, so the ligand exchange rate is obviously linked very closely to the size of the propagating couplings. Uh, and that's well defined analytically in that paper that I referred to by Sabotsky, describes some of the analytical derivations and uh, includes a set of, of equations. But what you can do is by ligand design, you can design your catalyst so it is less sterically bulky. In other words, it will bind bulkiest substrates. And that's something that we've, we've been working on for a while and hopefully we'll publish something quite shortly on that. So there are, there are a number of different approaches. There isn't at the moment a, a perfect catalyst for SABRE. The IMIS catalyst, which we've started out, which you can buy commercially is very, very good. Right. But if you're wanting the perfect catalyst for your specific substrate, I'm afraid there's quite a lot of work to get that right. And that does require you to change the temperature, for example, and the polarization transfer field to achieve the optimum result. That's great. Um, so I have a question, I have two questions. One is, can you go over the benefit slide again? So that would require you to share screen if that's all right. Um, and maybe while you're getting that, I'll ask the second one, which is, does the binding position influence the degree of polarization transfer? So take them in order. Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. Um, so the binding position, as in the important um, requirement for Sabre is um, that you break the symmetry. And the larger the couplings, the easier the flow of magnetization in terms of the more rapid the flow of magnetization. So if you think about the ligands that we've got um, in the catalyst. So if you look at this catalyst here, oops, what you can see is there are ligands that are trans to the hydrides. So classically, the symmetry of these two hydrides with respect to these two ligands 
in what is the equatorial plane is broken because this hydride couples differently to this ligand than that one. And that transcoupling arrangement has the largest couplings. So there is a greater efficiency of transfer into the trans ligand here that lies in the equatorial plane. But you can break the symmetry of the two hydrides by making this ligand and this ligand different. So here, for example, you have pyridine, but this complex would still satisfy the 18 electron rule if that was chloride. So now the two hydrides are in equivalent chemically, and that means they both couple to this axial ligand differently. But the axial couplings are much smaller than the trans couplings. So magnetization under Sabre does flow under those conditions into the axial ligands. So you can sensitize the carbene and the axial ligand. It's just much less efficient. Yep. And uh, okay. while, you're, while you're getting to that slide, uh, so there was a question was about- which slide, Matt, was, 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 I, was I asked to show? Uh, the benefit slide. But where was, I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask for further clarification. Um, the next question is what is the best way, this is sort of an experimental uh, implementation question. What is the best way of dispersing power hydrogen in the solution? We've tried a number of different approaches. Um, and if you look in the literature, you can see others have, have adopted the same and, and different um, methods. As in our best way currently is simply to pressurize the tube to six bar and have a manual shake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it is possible to use a center and to bubble hydrogen gas through the center that is dipped into the tube. We end up under our best approach getting a, around a factor of 30% less polarization using a sensor than we can through a shake. Um, there are other people that have used hollow fiber membranes and I think that certainly looks very promising. One of the challenges there is solvent compatibility but with, with the membrane. But I think those are the three approaches that I'm aware of. Um, it is a challenge. Uh, getting parahydrogen to exchange with the bulk solution is obviously important because if you don't have very much hydrogen solution, you haven't got that fuel to drive saber polarization. You know, in the world of polarized gas, like xenon in particular, um, certainly I used to do things back in the 90s with, with sintered, you know, uh, fritz and things. In that case, though, paramag there were lots of paramagnetic impurities, lots of, you know, long bindings, um, that would sort of shorten T1 locally. Is, that a, is there a sort of a similar thing that happens in power hydrogen? Where the fact that these, you know, anything that's sort of sintered or fritted um, has that potential to be either dirty and some of that dirt could be paramagnetic junk or? I think that's absolutely true. Um, right. If you look at NMR tubes in general, you just, you really do have to be quite careful. What we've seen in the first presentation this morning was an NMR tube with a cap, which I haven't illustrated particularly here. But what you are aware of there is that we're sealing the NMR tube under an atmosphere of parahydrogen and shaking it. Some NMR tubes destroy the parahydrogen very quickly because they've got impurities. Those are the ones that you rapidly need to discard. Right. So it's worth checking how quickly your NMR tube destroys your parahydrogen before you do these measurements. Because if you've got a batch of 20 some of them will be better than others. And I think that relates exactly to what you're saying. Um, in terms of sensors, we use quite a lot, but we haven't actually checked those um, to see how they, they do destroy the parahydrogen, partly because we're just bubbling it through. Um, and we've always had a reasonably high level of polarization, but it's certainly something that we might want to check because that would explain perhaps why we don't get the same levels of polarization using right. the shape and drop approach. Fantastic. Well, again, I want to thank our speaker again. Um, we are now entering the first PERM virtual coffee break. 
uh, we will reconvene at uh, 1225 UTC. We're going to keep the meeting active, just so you know, but we, we are going to, uh, the next speaker's coming in at 1225. Thank you again, Simon. Thank you very much.